to Easter. And the significance of Lent, the reason it's 40 days, is because it mirrors the 40 days that Jesus was tested in the wilderness before he started his public ministry. And one of the characteristics of Lent is that sometimes people fast, they give up certain things to both focus on who, uh, the experience that Jesus had, to create space in their life for God to work in their life, and to practice denying themselves so that when we reach Easter morning, we can celebrate all of the goodness that God has to give. And so maybe you're entering into this 40-day season intentionally doing some of that. Maybe you're here because we're having a service, and it's just what you do when we have services, and maybe Lent is familiar or unfamiliar. However you're, you're coming in tonight, we're, we're grateful that you're here, and our hope is that this marks a journey for you with God over the next 40 days, however you decide to engage in it. And one of the things that Ash Wednesday does for us as we start that journey is it reminds us of our frailty. It reminds us of our need. It reminds us that from dust we came, into dust we return. And in that, it highlights our need, our need for Jesus to bring life to us. And so over the course of this evening, we're going to sing, we're going to hear from the Word, we're going to have time to go before the Lord's table. You're going to have an opportunity to receive ashes on your head if you choose. It's okay if you don't. But it's a time for us to mark the beginning of a journey that leads us to celebrating the new life that Jesus brings and to restore to us everything that sin has taken from us. And so as we begin, hear these words, just a few words from Psalm 51, where David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant a willing spirit to sustain me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all that Jesus has done for us, how he has come to earth and taken on humanity and experienced all all that we experience with being tempted in the wilderness, with being tested by the evil one, by engaging with a world that's broken and in need. And so as we remember tonight our need for you, may his love and his provision be ever-present with us day by day, over these next 40 days. We pray this in your name. Amen. My name is Chris Hogan. I'm the executive director here at Meadowbrook. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I um, really appreciate everybody joining us on this Ash Wednesday that also gets to celebrate at the same time as Valentine's Day. What a beautiful picture of that world we already live in, right? Broken, yet alive and in love. When my oldest son was five, uh, I remember walking by the living room and, and he's sitting there playing. And I peeked over because there was just some interest in his eye, right? Peek over. And every time I look, he turns his shoulder, hides. I'm like, wait, now, now I'm wondering, like, something else is going on here, right? And, and so I asked him, like, hey, man, what, what do you got? Nothing. Now you know there's something, right? We've all, we've all seen this one. I'm like, no, you, you've got something. What do you, uh, not, just a toy. Okay. Well, and I started to realize, wait, I haven't seen this one before. I'm like, where'd the toy come from? I found it. I said, you found it? Where'd you find it? The store. You found it at the store? Yeah. Where was it at the store? Just lying there. And I was like, okay. Buddy, you can't just take stuff that comes from the store. 
even if you really want it. And he's like, well, I know, but look at how fun this is. And you start to have conversations. Do you know what happens when you take stuff that's not yours? Because eventually you get thrown in jail. It's against the law. So then he starts getting scared, right? And, and we decided, all right, here's what we're going to do. You need to go back to the store. You need to walk up to that clerk. You need to tell him that you took this. And you need to ask him to forgive you and if you need to do anything for it. And if I'm honest, as a parent, I wanted that clerk to put a little more of that fear of God in him. Right? But we, we drive to the store, and I remember him just sitting in the car behind me, in the seat, not wanting to get out. He was so scared of what was about to happen to him. And with some coaxing, he walked in. And he walked right up, and we could see him through the window of the store. We see him approach. And knowing him, I could see the timidness in him and that slow, like, walk. And then something changed. Because I could see his interaction with the clerk in and that tension, that tightness that had been inside of him slowly started to release. And all of a sudden, you could see him breathe. And he walked out. And I was like, did you give him the, did you give him the toy? Yeah. Okay, what did he tell you? He said, thank you for being honest and that it was going to be okay. In that one moment, you could see him just become new again. He understood this idea of mercy. He walked in there with this fear that he was going to be put in handcuffs because he's five and that's what he thought happened. And he walked out going, oh, I'm okay. But here's the problem. It didn't last that long because eventually it's the way life goes, right? That, that mercy, that truth that we're handing down to other people, something else steps in the way. Something else gets in the way and it gets ruined. There's another mistake, there's another error, there's another problem. And slowly that tension, that frustration, that hurt starts to seep back in. Today we're going to spend a little time in a psalm where the psalmist is dealing with the same issue, where he looks around him and he sees a world that has seen God and seen God's mercies, but slowly found themselves just slipping away from it, just being burdened by the world, trying to solve their own problems. So if you turn with me to Psalm 85, we're just going to start by reading the first seven verses. The psalmist writes, you, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the inequity of your, of your people. You covered all their sins. You set aside all their wrath. You turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us this, your salvation. We don't know a lot about when this is written. There's a lot of speculation, but most, most people believe this is written only a short time after Israel is returned from their exile in Babylon. They had spent 70 years between their exile and the rebuilding of the temple. Seventy years separated from God, only to be brought back in. They would felt God's mercy. They felt God's gifts. They felt God's favor, but slowly the tensions of the world had started to kick in, right? The sins, the frustrations, the hardships, you know, maybe I could take care of this one on my own. But what we see in this is 
the psalmist has a deep understanding rooting of who God is and a call to who God can be for him and for the people of Israel. Four times in the first six verses, we see the word shuv, right? Shuv is a word that simply means to restore, to turn back, to make original again. And that's at the base meaning, right? We see, we see it twice in the past tense, where we see the Lord, he restored the fortunes of Jacob. He's already done it. He turned from his fierce anger. Right? He's done this. The psalmist understands and knows because of where he's been. He knows because of what God has led him through that God will do it again. But he also feels the hardship of his people because we see that same term used as he reaches this present tense and present form when he calls out, Lord, restore us again. And we found ourselves in the same spot. We messed up a little bit. Right? Or revive us again, turn us back. But there's a deeper meaning when we see this word shuv from the psalmist. And that's this understanding, not just of being turned back, not just of being restored, but to understand who you were in true design and principle. And to know that the only person who can ever do that is God. As I look around this room, you can see lots of construction going on, right? We live in a constructive world. There's two different real forms of construction going on. We have one that's being renovated, right? We renovate. That's what we're doing here. We're taking what we have, we're breaking it down, we're making it new to serve the same purpose, right? The other type is to restore, to make new. You take it, understand what it was created for, the beauty and the creation, right? We see it in a lot of older homes. You start to restore, bring back the same materials, the same purpose, the same building. It looks like it was created to be because what it was created to be was so special. And that's what this word shuv means, that God's creation in you is so special that only he can bring you back to what that was. See, the people are stuck in this process of renovation. Don't worry, I'll make it new. Don't worry, I'll fix it. Don't worry. We can, we can make ourselves better. And the psalmist goes, God, the only one to make us better is the only one who could make us what we were built to be. See, he acknowledged who God was in the past and what God could do. And because he did that, we see this transition in this psalm. We see the transition in the message that he's giving. And that comes here in verses 8 and 9. He says, I will listen to what the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in his land, or in our land. There's a couple key things here. Notice verse 8. I will listen to God. I will listen to what the Lord says. When we sit and listen, we can only do that when we truly understand what we're listening for. When we understand the personal attributes, we understand the heart, right? Because if we don't, we start to get antsy. We start to go, oh, it's been a little long. Maybe I can do this differently, right? It's Valentine's Day, so let's take it this way. Look at the person next to you. A lot of people next to a loved one, some of you know, right? If I were to say, what's this person going to do in this situation? How many times would you go, oh, I know exactly what they're going to say, right? How many times have you called somebody on the phone and go, man, I wish you were here because you totally would have done this, right? The more time you spend with somebody you love or somebody, 
you start to get all of those little pieces of who they are, and you start to know them so deeply that they don't even have to be there, and you know exactly what they're going to say and do. And that's what the psalmist is telling us. I know, God, who you've been. I know what you've done. I know who you are, and I know I can sit. I can sit and patiently wait for you to do the work that you're setting out to do. Because ultimately, what he strives for is God to be returned to the land, not just to come for a visit, not just to be here and gone, but to dwell. Right? The same word means to live forever, to rest forever, and to do that with his people. See, the psalmist speaks because he knows God. He knows exactly who he is. He doesn't question that. And because of that, he points us in a direction towards the future that we get to know how it lives out, but he didn't necessarily in that moment. And it's fun because at this point in the psalm, most people would suggest that the psalm transitions from an actual song to a time of response, to where the psalmist would read the first part of the verse and then it would, the second set would be repeated to him. And verse 10 starts, love and faithfulness meet together and the response would be righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Notice that the psalmist is being reminded in these verses of why he can be trusting and sit in silence with God because he understands these four key attributes of who God is. Right? The first is that God is a God of love. Right? It's not to be distracted from that love to that care. This word translates also as mercy. He's a God who cares for those in deep need and want. Right? Next, he's a faithful God. This faithfulness is the idea that God doesn't change. He's true. He is who he is. Because he doesn't change, the psalmist can, under, can sit there and go, he will do what he said he was going to do. Even if it takes generations. Right? Third is, God is righteous. He is just in his judgment, in his actions. He is right. God's not going to do anything that would go against his character, that would act in a way that would do things that were wrong or against his ability to love, his ability to be faithful. And last, he's a God of peace. Love this translation, the word peace, because the same word means be well with. Be it well with. It's a powerful statement. Not just peace. Not just, yeah, go on your way, peace. But be it well with. Deep in your soul to have comfort when the world is shaken around you. But it takes to sit in silence sometimes, right? To know that, man, I got to just trust that God's moving in my life, but everything else is getting me antsy. Okay? I think it's really beautiful because what really is painted in this picture of who God is shows itself over 400 years later. Because we see this idea of mercy, right? This idea of mercy where he says that mercy and faithfulness meet together. Mercy, right? The mercy of love meets the truth of faithfulness. And that happens at the cross. It happens as Jesus 
is sacrificed. That same sacrifice that, that he says he's so surely waiting for because that's what will lead to the dwelling of God in the land. The second half of the verse just as powerful because the response to that cross is two things, right? It's this understanding that faithfulness, or sorry, that righteousness, right? This justice of God, it only works for one thing. It only works because it's through his grace. Because we know what judgment for sin is. It's death. And the grace of the cross, that changed everything and ultimately peace. This understanding that at the cross, mercy and truth merged to provide salvation, and grace and peace connected. They kissed to create an everlasting connection. Right? But it's funny because we go a step further in these verses, we look at 12 and 13, because if we're honest, that's a great feeling, right? We know that we have that salvation at the cross, and we know that God is here to dwell, but we also know we're in this frail middle ground where, yeah, God's here, but so is everything else. And I'm stuck in this understanding that that my body is fading, that if I'm honest, at times my hope is fading, if I'm honest, at times everything around me seems like crumbling, but, but you're telling me that, that the salvation's there and God's there to dwell, and, and the psalmist goes, hold on, because there's more to this story. And that's this understanding that we live in this, this element knowing that, that all these things are going around, but the true peace that God's providing isn't here yet, Right? It's this true peace that we have the ability to look forward to the salvation of eternity with God to provide for us. And he, he shows this up as he, as he writes verses 12 and 13, and it begins with this, The Lord will indeed give what is good. Not what you want. Not what you hope for. Not what you wish you had. He'll give what is good. Because he is good. And our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. See, the beautiful thing about this psalm is it, it hits us on two levels, right? We know that we can live in this. We can feel God's righteousness go before us. We can feel the justice that God had and the grace that he presented to us, but we know that we don't have it yet. And the psalmist says, just wait. Just rest. Just listen, because there's this eternity in front of us. And sometimes, when you feel lost and broken and hurt, and you're not sure where your next step is, your hope can be found there. Your hope can be found in the understanding that eternity waits in front of you. The, the beautiful thing here is this. God's provisions are great. God's restoration is great. We're going to close with a song tonight that I just wanted to guide us through beforehand. Um, Horatio Stafford wrote a song called It Is Well. Many of us have probably heard it, sung it. But the story behind it adds a little more depth. See, Horatio was a lawyer in Chicago in the late 1800s. And as he was progressing and gaining his wealth, the Chicago fires hit. For three days, the fires burned, destroying 30,000 properties, leaving 100,000 people homeless 
and destroying much of his wealth. Three years later, Horatio, having rebuilt his wealth, decides that he's going to take his family on a vacation to Europe because his friend D.L. Moody is speaking there, and he wants to be there for it. But work comes up. And he tells his wife and daughter, four daughters, you go on ahead, I'll meet you there. And as he's working, and his four, wife and four daughters are on this quest to Europe, their ship hits a steel ship. And the lives of his daughters are all lost at sea. And Horatio receives a telegraph from his wife as she finally makes her way to Europe. Simply two words. Saved alone. So now Horatio is left in Chicago with a frustration and understanding that maybe he should have been there as part of that. Maybe he shouldn't have sent off his family. And now he's making his way across to go be with his wife to try to provide any comfort he can and as the ship starts to cross the point to where his, the ship that carried his wife and daughter sank, the captain pulls him aside and says, Horatio, this is about the spot. And Horatio pens these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my loss, my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I'm not naive. I don't think that he was in perfect peace in this moment. There's probably pain and frustration and hurt and anger, but at the core he knew, he knew who God was. And he knew that God had a greater plan. He knew that he, the benefit and the grace and the mercy that he'd received from that cross. He knew so much that as he continued on, he wrote this. No pain shall be mine, for in death as in life, Thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. As I sit in silence, I can hear God whisper peace into my soul. See, God restores. God restored in the past. God restores in the present. God restores in the future. God restores to eternity. And in this time of Lent, when we so sit on this idea of fragility, we sit in this idea of not enough, let us also sit and listen to God as he tells us the story's been written. That we can sit in this understanding that at the end of this journey lies the cross, lies the salvation that we long for lies the ability for God to dwell with us. So, we wanted to move on then to this understanding, this dichotomy almost, between the fragility of life and the grace of the cross. And so, and to do this, we'll, be, we'll celebrate communion together today. And for those who you like, we'll also have stations to receive ashes. We do this in understanding that from dust we came and dust will return, but that's not the end of the story. The way this works here as we, uh, as we go to communion is We'll have the ushers come forward and they'll release you row by row. Come through the middle row, go through the sides, 
to receive your communion elements. They're stacked on top of each other. Um, the juice on the top and the wafer on the bottom. And then if you'd like to continue on to receive ashes, they'll be at the far end and then you can go back to your seat. We will receive our communion together today. Um, so you're invited to sit, to rest with your elements, and to listen to what God's telling you and where God's guiding you in this moment. We pray. Father, I know you are the God of restoration. I know because you've restored so many things around me and you've restored what's inside of me, but sometimes it's hard. It's hard because I want to control some of those elements out there. I pray, Lord, that you can continue to remind me of who you are because that's who you've always been. Pray, Lord, as we approach this table today, we can do it with hearts ready and willing to recognize who you are, the Lord and Savior, not just of this moment, not just of today, but of eternity to come. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen.